Hello everyone, welcome back to Inside Arsenal and it is of course as you can see right now if you're watching on YouTube I'm joined by James Bend which means one thing, it is Inside Arsenal Extra Time. James, a little bit later this week, Friday, don't often do that, how's the uh, how's the week been mate? Yeah, I, well I'm quite groggy and quite bleary eyed, um, even though I don't really know why I did, I sort of had to stay up for all of deadline day, um, which obviously is why we delayed this video because you never know and... I mean, Charles, we were roundly vindicated, weren't we, by a thrilling denouement to transfer the transfer window, not just for Arsenal, but for the whole Premier League. What a day it was. Yeah. Yeah, I did laugh. I flicked on Sky Sports News for, I don't know, probably about a minute, just because I was kind of interested at one point during the day. I was like, I wonder what they are actually talking about here. And I, I flicked it on for about a minute and I just thought, yeah, this is this, this must be hard work in that studio <laughs> right now. Actually, for the whole month, it should have been, it must have been really hard work. It was without doubt the most stress-free transfer deadline day I've had in definitely about 10 years. I think going back to my pre-Arsenal days when I was covering Reading um, at the local paper there, which was always mad transfer deadline days to yesterday. I went down the gym yesterday, I went down the gym. I wasn't even worried about checking my phone to see what was going on or if I'd missed anything because it just nothing you know nothing was happening we were told nothing was happening and for once I actually genuinely believed it that nothing was happening and um yeah interesting one isn't it and it's not just for Arsenal it's, it's for the whole Premier League I, I wonder if this is the start of what we are going to see in most January windows from now on I wonder if last January was the there was the last sort of big spend in January we're going to see and things might be different from from going forward and this might almost be kind of the norm from now on what do you think I think for teams like Arsenal more often than not yes because the value isn't there the players aren't there like you know I mean Arteta said didn't he He said we would like to have strengthened our squad in January but we just couldn't find anyone that was worth sort of spending the money on Mm. I, I do wonder if like I mean, obviously, the I mean, it's hard to know with Forest because I think Forest are sort of a little bit addicted to transfers, but I think teams in the Forest, Everton, Palace, you know, Brentford nexus of the table, I think some of them have been a little bit more cautious this year, just because they look at that bottom three and go, or oh, what, what we, what was the bottom three until this week? And sort of go well. Two of them are definitely gone: Burnley and Sheffield United, and we think Luton are going in as well. So let's keep our powder dry here. No need to spend if we don't need to. And I, I can't imagine that'll be the case next year when you have you know good teams come up from the Championship. Um, so I think you'll still get that. It'll go, but um, but that that's kind of always been the way it has, isn't it? Is the good teams don't really do much, and then those teams scrapping for their lives, sort of dropping huge amounts of money on Darren Bent or whoever. Um, and I think that will continue. There wasn't one of those sort of big deals, which can yeah. often cause the kind of snowball effect, which then, you know, one big, big bit of money that goes between clubs can then open up markets for other clubs, you know, because the whoever's sold then needs to buy and then money starts to change hands, you know, mm. and trips around the clubs. And that can often happen. Just, there was just nothing really like that. Um, certainly not Premier League to Premier League. Say if someone had, you know, a Chelsea had, knocked on the door of Palace and offered 80 million for Eze or Elise or something like that. That could have sparked into life because Palace would then have to replace and, you know, something like that could have happened. But because it didn't, it was just a very, I don't know if stagnant's a word, but it was just, just nothing happened. You just kind of watched from afar thinking, so is something going to burst into life here? But you never got the impression it was really going to happen. Um, and yeah, I mean, from Arsenal's point of view, it was... It was very much as expected. I mean, I'm heading down to London Cup. <laughs> sorry, sorry, <laughs> not heading down to London Colney. I am, in fact, heading down to the Showbar Realty Training Centre in a, in a couple of hours to speak to Mikel Arteta at his press conference ahead of game against Liverpool after Arsenal announcing today this new, what we've been told is a multi-million pound deal with uh, the... Dubai-based luxury real estate developer to become the club's first ever training ground naming rights. They're also going to have their their uh, name on the training kit sleeves for the men and the women. Um, yeah, it's good. so I, I don't think I'm ever, ever, ever going to call it that, I have to say. <laughs> but I think it's always, always going to be London Colney. But um, 
yeah, it'll be interesting to see what Mikel Arteta has got to say when uh, when he gets down there, when we get down there today and in, in terms of what Arsenal did in the window, because it was just very much outgoings and young outgoings. I mean, that was the, the theme of the window, certainly the theme of the end of the window. Quite a few players heading off the likes of Lino Sosa going um, to Aston Villa on a permanent deal, which I think is probably the most eye-catching transfer of the lot um, in terms of Arsenal. Unbelievable, this. Not my hot scoop on Miguel Aziz. <laughs> yeah, poor Miguel Aziz. Third tier of Spanish football. He's gone to yeah. what a um uh yeah. Once kind of tips is the next big thing, wasn't it? It just hadn't quite worked out for uh, for Miguel Aziz. <laughs> I think that sort of story, Aziz, is a uh, I think something we have to consider when sort of now you look at the the reaction to the Lino Sosa deal, for example, you know, mm. oh, oh, so, yeah, he should have been given a chance and all that. And, and I would have liked to have seen him given a chance. Um, but I think sometimes you've got to look at players like Miguel Aziz and, I don't know, Javier Amici, players like yeah. that, who, you know, everyone thinks are going to be absolute worldies. They don't, they go somewhere else. There's a massive reaction to them going somewhere else. And then suddenly you don't really hear or see anything of them again. I'm not saying that's going to happen with Lino Sozi. He might well go on and be a, a, an absolute success. But um, it does rarely happen, I have to admit, when you do lose a younger player. Next, so I'm thinking Serge Gnabry obviously is one, but that was a little mm. bit different. That yeah. wasn't, you know, that was that whole, the way that all panned out. You know, he was very much, Arsenal knew he was a special talent and they wanted him. And then he got the injuries and then he didn't want to sign a new contract and he went. It wasn't a case of not being given an opportunity. It was he very much decided he was going to go. Um, the injuries obviously stifled his development at Arsenal and then the loan deals didn't work and he just got a bit annoyed and, and, and wanted to go. So I think that was a little bit different. But I mean, how do you view it all with the what we've seen in the end of the window with the likes of, you know, as you said, Aziz going, but Lino Sosa going without ever making his debut for Arsenal. And it certainly sparked that debate again, isn't it, in terms of what, you know, how Mikel's managing some of these younger players that are just on the cusp of the first team, but don't seem to be getting an opportunity to show what they can do. Yeah. But then that debate, you know, so Sousa, left back. Uh, as like, well, Last I checked, Arsenal's options at left back are include but are not limited to Alexander Zinchenko, Yuri and Tim, but Takahiro Tomiyasu, Jakub Kivior, uh, Kieran Tierney, strictly speaking, because we're not expecting him to stay at Real Sociedad. None of those players are sort of in their late 30s. You know, the likelihood is that in that group I named you, you have Arsenal starting left back over the next five years. So... What on earth would the point have been of keeping Sousa? Like, I mean, I agree there are sort of ways you could finagle the path to get yourself a bit more money. Like, could he have played a few games that just sort of bump up his value? Mm. Absolutely. But like the the path for Sousa to be a Premier League starter for Arsenal, as far as I can tell, doesn't exist. And I think in that circumstance, if you think the player's good. I, I think there's a strong argument to like, don't waste your time loaning him out forever to clubs that aren't going to be invested in developing him. Like get, get yourself some, some long-term money on this guy. I mean, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong. It's the same with Bradley Ibrahim. We're talking quite a minimal, like direct fee. Mm. Um, but there's lot, plenty of, of opportunities for Arsenal in terms of matching, right? Sell on clause, appearance fees, and I think maybe that's just worth doing. I, I mean, speaking to, I, I mean, I know you're the same. We kind of know quite a few agents that have players that in, in the youth setup at a lot of Premier League clubs. And I think there's a the sense that a lot of kids are just getting a bit sick and tired of being thrown to the wind between 18 and 20. You know, one, one month you're in Darlington, the next you're in Ibiza, and it doesn't serve your development. I mean, I do appreciate that Sousa's just gone straight on loan to Plymouth. So we'll see how that does. But, you know, Arsenal have given... I, I think this is a better chance for Arsenal to make something out of this young footballer than keeping him on the bench. And whilst, it, whilst I think there's ways you can get yourself more money on the front end, like I don't could never see a world where he was going to be Arsenal's left back. I no, yeah, no, I agree. I spoke about it yesterday. Again, I listed that. I didn't even consider Kieran Tierney or Jakob Kivio, to be honest, but I was just thinking, I mean, you've got 
obviously Zinchenko and then you've got Timber and, and Tommy Asu and people saying, well, Timber and Tommy Asu aren't, aren't left backs. They're naturally on a right footed, but they're, they're very much left backs in Mikel Arteta's eyes and or can be left back in Mikel Arteta's eyes. So yeah. there is no pathway, I think, for Sosa. But then again, people then say, well, we didn't know how good he was. Look at what's going on at Liverpool with um, Connor Bradley. You know, he was just you know, nowhere near the first team. Suddenly there was an opportunity. He went in and looks like an absolute superstar. And could that have happened with Lino Sosa? And then there is always that sort of debate and there was a, that sort of sense of unknown, I suppose. But um, but Liverpool didn't force that opportunity with Bradley. Like Trent was injured. Um, hmm. The other young right back they have, whose name escapes I me, mean, he's been injured a lot. So it was pretty much sort of, and I mean, they, you know, everyone goes about Connor Bradley. If Joe Gomez, sorry, if if Rob, one of Robertson or Simicast was fit, then Joe Gomez would be playing at right back, and they'd be playing at left back. Like, and I mean, I'm not saying that I'm not saying that to criticise Liverpool. That's just always how it happens. No one was sort of saying Alex Iwobi. I mean, you know, when he broke through into the Arsenal first team, people thought highly of him, but basically it was. Look, we've got absolutely no one to pick from in the senior squad. Alex, you're up. That's it, that's suppose, quite but, often. Is how but there happens. is there. I suppose there has been that argument, isn't there? That Tommy Asu's been out, Timber's been out, Zinchenko's been out, and so mm-hmm. you've been playing moving Jakob Kivior to play a left back in a few games when maybe you could have played a natural left back in in Sosa and actually seen what he had to had to offer. So I can see why people. I'll point into it, but I do agree that I don't see any long-term, you know, I didn't see any pathway for Sosa on the long-term to, to become an Arsenal regular. And I thought it was quite interesting. You talked about um, your story that you, you broke yesterday with, with Miguel Aziz heading off to uh, tell me the name of that team again. <laughs> Christ. Can I check my Twitter feed? Atletico Balianese. It's a great name. I believe it's in Mallorca. Is it? It's a great name. Or sort of, yeah. He obviously likes it out there, heading off to uh, Ibiza as well. Who can like, blame him? Um, and I was reading your piece on the on the um, the sort of CBS transfer blog that was running, and you were talking a little bit about how a sort of ch- change or a shift in how Arsenal and clubs might operate. And like you said, some players just don't really aren't that keen on the sort of loan thing anymore. And it is a case of well, if you're not going to play, then we're not going to just consistently loan you out. You may as well go out and and you know we'll get a bit of money for you protect ourselves with some sell-on clauses and things like that and you go out and develop yourselves elsewhere is it is that something you sort of see now then with the way that how clubs are going to be handling their young players yeah i know villa another club that do the same and sort of at a much higher level it has to be said city are just you know they're doing it with everyone i mean uh, you know even look at someone like morgan rogers who went from city to city from city to Middlesbrough for for not a huge amount of money and um I think now city will have got somewhere in the region of two to three million if all the clauses are fulfilled in in Rogers's deal with with Villa I I think it's an option isn't it you wouldn't want the next Bukayo Saka to be sold with sell-on clauses attached and, and buyback options so that you end up having to scrap to get a sacker back in the club but I, th- I i think you need more pathways because look you know you've covered efl teams you know that when the chips are down um managers in the championship in league one the first players they're taking out of the 11 are your miguel azizes and mm. you know i think arsenal have done a really good job Certainly did a really good job on the Ben Napper of finding some clubs, especially any that was managed by Michael Appleton, um, finding clubs that they felt they could trust. But those clubs that don't exist for Arsenal's benefit. And I mean, I saw a great point um, Scott Willis made sort of in reply to what I posted that was pretty much, look, this is the argument for going out and buying yourself a club in the French Mm. second tier or whatever it is, because, you know, if they're taking their ultimate orders from Josh Cronkey, then Josh Cronkey just says, look, here's, uh, you know, here's Kayon Edwards, play him. Or, uh, you know, <laughs> that is your job now, to play him and make him better for Arsenal. I don't, I hate that model. It, it sounds horrible. Like, I wouldn't want to be a supporter of a team that's effectively a feeder club for Arsenal or City or whoever. 
but you, you see the logic and without that it's very hard to sort of really control player growth so it's going to it's certainly going to be more of a string in the in the or a string in the bow yeah of of teams like Arsenal and and I think it will happen more and more cuz as i just said the kids are getting tired of this as well they they know it's not good for their career and you know smart agents will say let's just get this guy out permanently and and make sure Arsenal can can wet their beak in the future yeah i think it's a really good point i think there's so many loan spells you see just go terribly when you think they're a decent player but they go on loan see so you don't know the situation of the club they can end up in a relegation battle or something like that. And like you said, those managers were like, am I going to use an 18-year-old kid who's used to academy football at a club like Arsenal or am I going to use a seasoned professional who can just get down and dirty and fight and battle and, you know, just do everything to get the three points? You know how they, that is going to go. And you can see you see really talented players just not get a look in and then have to get recalled by the club. So you, you've got to really pick and choose the loans well and it's not, it's not an easy thing to do. I mean, Arsenal did send a couple of players out on loan yesterday a couple of um the youngsters Charles Sago Jr went to Swansea Kyle Edwards who you mentioned I think he went to Leighton Orient didn't Leighton he Orient. um Zane Monlouis went to to Reading so they didn't it wasn't just a case of getting people out permanently yesterday in terms of youngsters so there was they did use the loan market as well um are we we've had so many questions I asked yesterday for people to send in sort of <laughs> questions comments about about you know anything and so many of them were about Arteta's management of youngsters. You see there's a few of them on the screen here from Rizwan, from Anton, from uh, user GK4GG. Um, uh, and they're all kind of talking about the same thing. You know, Rizwan's saying, what your opinions are Arteta's management of Arsenal Academy inclusions to the first team? Uh, are Per and others doing a good job of managing and maturing our Academy products to a level needed to get a chance? Or are there just not a ton of opportunities? Um Anton says we may as well not bloody have a youth academy if the attitude is going to be um, if there's people ahead of them or uh, are they good enough? How will we know if they don't bloody play them? It's funny that City, Liverpool and other teams don't have that mindset. Um, the bottom one, no name, says we certainly need to give more chances to the young lads. When Yeri is ready for cameos, as is Walter Rosiak too. I have to say that out of Sosa and Rosiak. Yes, I know he plays six. So I'd pick Rosiak. He's not far off the standard we need in terms of quality. So this is the thing I'm kind of talking about. See, I, I watched a lot of the you run to the Youth Cup final last year and watched a lot of Rosiak, who I think is a really talented kid. He's very good on set pieces. But in no way did I ever think he was anywhere close to being ready to play for a first team of Arsenal. It's easy to sit there and, and, and watch clips of some of the younger games. But there was no one watching that youth run. And I include Wanieri, Cozy Dubri and and Miles Lewis Skelly in that. That I, I sat there thinking, oh, they should get in the first team right now. And I think it's 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 an easy thing to fall into, a trap to fall into, to think these kids are definitely ready because you see them doing some good stuff against other academy teams. The step up is so massive, so huge, especially when you're talking about a club like Arsenal um, and what they're competing for to suddenly throw them in, it's, it just doesn't really work like that at all. Um, but having said that, I do think as well, and I said it earlier, there was there's definitely been some missed opportunities for Arteta where you can pick and choose your moments to give some minutes to see how they handle it. The PSV game was a classic example. There was yeah. a, it, it, might, it was just a massive missed opportunity to give a couple of uh, the youngsters a, a bit of a run out and just to see what they can do. And not just so much see what they can, can do, but give them a sense of, oh, you know, there I can get on. And and it sends a message to other young kids see, who see it as well, saying, oh, look, they, they are there. Um, they're, they're on the pitch for the first team. And sometimes I do feel like you just need to do that, to take a bit of a chance. And out of all of the top managers at the top of the Premier League right now, I'll say certainly from what we've seen, Arteta is probably the most resistant to doing that mm. when you compare him to the likes of Klopp and even, you know, I suppose Pep, but, I think the play, the young players that Pep's using are on a very different kind of level and experience than than some of the youngsters that Arsenal could potentially use. I mean, and how many academy graduates has at Man City in a lot, 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 lot longer the time than Arteta has has Pep established in the first team? Hmm. Phil Foden and is that it? Yeah, I mean, you say Oscar Bob now, I suppose. Yeah, count, but I mean, I mean academy. Yeah, I mean, Cole Palmer, obviously, a little bit as well. I mean, for starters, it sort of seems like, I know there's a sort of subsection of Arsenal fandom that believe that 
if you give the guy a debut, you're entirely responsible for all their professional development from that point onwards. So therefore, nothing that Martinelli, Ketia, Bukayo Saka have done under Mikel Arteta is in any way to his credit. Um, but I mean, this is a, an Arsenal first eleven built around academy products, isn't it? You know, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't buy the argument that he doesn't trust Arsenal youngsters when he built his whole, his whole squad around them. You know, mm. and when Saka and Martinelli are carrying such a load, I mean, I, I, I am sympathetic to the idea that yeah, like that PSV game was a missed opportunity. I think it would be great if at some stage Arsenal could just draw some bad teams. Um, in either the EFL or the um, FA Cup. But look, I mean, you know, the same Arsenal fans that say where's where are the minutes for academy players will also go, oh, you know, we haven't got a, a third left eight option. Mikel Arteta has left us chronically short um, of options in our squad. It's time for him to go. You can't have it both ways. You can either run an ultra small squad or you know and and fill it with youngsters or you can have a quite deep squad um i think arteta probably is actually more than he would admit has quite a deep squad in terms of talent and you know when it came to that efl cup game against brentford for instance there weren't many players in that 11 that you were like gosh they 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 really can't afford to be risked so i mean and then of course there's the other possibility that Look, the guys that have come out of the academy post, and we spoke about this last week, post Saka, Smith Rowe, and Ketia, that they're just not as good. Yeah, Radical and I think that's idea, a key thing, isn't it? It's a key yeah. thing, though. No one, no one's banging the door down, are they? There's no, there's no one in my view that I'm looking at thinking they are absolutely good enough. And the guys through. that are a, a 16, 17, and it's not yet. Yeah, there's no rush. No. The fact that Lamine Yamal or whoever is playing for Barcelona doesn't mean that Arteta's doing it wrong. There's some interesting ones here from Kinsella. So in the ultimate for any football club to bring players up through their academy and youth team into the first team, no massive transfer fee has been paid. There's every chance a player could be a future star and subsequently worth a fortune to the club in the transfer market. I do wonder sometimes about Arteta and the club's judgment in letting these youngsters go. When are they ever given a solid chance to show what they can do? To, can do? YouTube is lit up with Arsenal need a striker. And at the start of the season, it's goodbye, Mr. Balogun, you are excess baggage. Bizarre at times, I think. Charles, um, again, I mean, Balogun, I don't agree. Really Balogun was a good sale. You know, I'm absolutely convinced he was a good sale. It was just, he wasn't going to play much at Arsenal. He wasn't going to get ahead of Jesus. You know, he, Arsenal have got in Keto. I mean, Balogun's what, he scored four goals this season for Monaco, yeah. I think, so far. It's not like he's tearing it up in France or anything. He had a good season last year. And that was this, that was an example of Arsenal using the loan system well, what they did with Balogun last year. Did it expertly and they ended up making about 30 or £35 million pounds from it, um, which is what you want to do. And I, I don't think the ultimate for any football club is to bring through the academy. It's great, but the academy is absolutely essential now in modern football to making money. It's about, if you can getting a couple of players come through that you can play in the first team absolutely and that is the dream of everyone in the academy that is what they work towards but it is also an absolutely essential piece of business for the for football clubs now in terms of making revenue and generating revenue as Hampstead Owl underneath says we need to get away from thinking the academy as a place for the next generation first team is being grown of course from time to time a world-class talent like Saka or a high caliber Premier League standard player like Smith Rowe will come through but a club with ambition of Arsenal is always going to have to equip itself with the best players from around the world and it is against the laws of probability, if nothing else, to imagine that all of these, or even most, will emerge from hell end. Rather, the academy is a talent factory manufacturing product that can be sold as profit to other clubs to help finance our blue chip buys. Hell enders who can significantly augment the quality of the first team squad are an occasional and nice bonus, but it is not to be relied upon. I think that's a really good comment, and I think that is exactly what Arsenal, what Man City, everyone. Uh, mm. is, and now having to sort of that's that is the basically business model of the academy isn't it it is if you can get a brilliant player like Saka then fantastic but if not you you develop players as best as possible and you can sell them and generate revenue for the club and I think that is absolutely a key part of every club's business model I, I think with Arsenal fans overly romanticize the academy and I think they think back to you know that picture of Wenger 
with all the the young future core of Oxlade Chamberlain and Walcott and Aaron Ramsey and Carl Jenkinson, Jack Wilshire. Um, and I need not remind you, Charles, how few of those were actually Arsenal Academy graduates. Mm. Like, I don't think there was, you know, you have to go back, I would say, to that the George Graham team that was largely built from the academy in a entirely different era of football to find a a team that is more academy based arsenal academy based than the current one yeah um and so to me it just remains baffling that this of all things is a is a stick to beat Mikel Arteta with even Arsene Wenger who clearly understood the value of the academy that was a fu- it was only a function of his vision of a young football team mm. like a, a team of young moldable footballers he didn't particularly care whether they came from Hale End or from Southampton I mean yeah, evidently so yeah I, I Hampstead I'll hit the nail on the head there I kind of maybe think I should just left it with him yeah I know I thought that was very good summing up of the uh of the whole thing for me um before we kind of move on and start focusing a little bit on Liverpool's game just a quick one here from uh Josh says question for you and James on extra time with the transfer window coming to an end what are each of your top five Arsenal January transfers in the Premier League era do you want to go first uh, yeah go on I think number one's quite easy um Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang and it's sad how it ended but oh, when he was good yeah two you know I've got a soft spot for him uh Nacho Monreal uh, I think any time in January, you can go in January and find yourself a left back for five, six years. Perfect. Three, Andre Arshavin. Uh, stop me if you think I miss anyone. But yeah, yeah, wasn't great. That 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 star burnt very brightly, very briefly. Um, it was fourth, fun while it lasted, though. It was so fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, that goal against Blackburn. Um, four... I suppose through gritted teeth, Emmanuel Adebayor, but we don't want to talk about that. Uh, and then five already, I would probably put in the mix, Leandro Trossard. I mean, I, I, I think it's a shame that it didn't end the way his signing was supposed to end, but I don't think he, he could say that he was the reason Arsenal didn't win the title. And I think he's been a really nice pickup. Have I missed anyone? Dennis oh, Suarez. No. Of course, Kim Kalstrom. How, how can you possibly forget Dennis Suarez or Kim Kalstrom? I mean, you talk about signings that block academy products. Dennis Suarez meant fewer minutes, fewer squad places for both Smith Rowe and Saka, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah, Dennis Suarez. Um, who would I add into that mix? I would add Theo Walcott <sighs> into that mix. Um, Erdegaard. Odegaard, does that count as loan? Because that was loan. He was term permanent in the summer. Would you count a loan? I suppose it's a January. I, signing, I would isn't accept it? that. Yeah, and, and if, you, if we hadn't to... got him, then probably wouldn't have ended up getting him on a permanent basis in the summer. So yeah, absolutely, Martin Odegaard has to go in there. Um, Theo, you know, over a hundred goals for the club, um, criminally underrated, I think. Uh, Theo Walcott, absolutely. I can't believe I put Adebayor in when. Um, those yeah, were... I wouldn't. I wouldn't be having Adebayor in there. I can't bring myself to have Adebayor in there. So, um, although he did do very good things for the club, obviously while he was there. Um, so yeah, Theo, um, Nacho absolutely has to be in there. Um, Go on, you need to do yours in order, no? Uh, no, I'm not doing it in order. That's too hard. That's too hard. Um, can I put? I know who I'm going to put in there. Thierry Henry. Okay. When he, when he came back when he came back. I know he only was here for about a month or six weeks, but he gave me one of my greatest moments of following Arsenal when he scored that goal against Leeds, and one of the greatest Emirates moments. And that was because he came in that January. So I'm going to put Thierry Henry just for that one moment. It was absolutely on, glorious. On that, you know, um, I mean, I don't. I'm sure you're the same. My Facebook now is entirely sort of given over to. Uh, it reminding me of things I posted back when yeah, I yeah. used Facebook. Um, and I had one come up, obviously, earlier this month that was pretty much sort of, no, Thierry, no, please don't come back. You'll only ruin your legacy if you're here. Oh, sometimes it's really nice to be wrong. Yeah, absolutely. It still annoys me loads that he had his goal taken away from him in the win against, I think, was it Blackburn at home? Mm. 
Um, it was his last game, I think, of that loan spell, and he scored. And it was given. It was taken away. It was given as an own goal, even though it was clearly a sh- his shot on target. Just took a big deflection, and it went down. It's, it's just really annoys me. Whenever I see his goal, you know, final goal tally, it should be one more because he was totally robbed of that goal. Um, but yeah, I'd put Thierry Henry, Henry in there just because of that. Yeah, that Leeds moment was just so so special. I'd have. I'd probably have. I'd probably have our, our Shavin would probably make it just because. Although it was brief, and he did his form did just fall off a cliff completely when he was at Arsenal. For for initially, it was so much fun, and he was so good, and he just reignited a season that was a hot had been a horrible season, and just gave us some great moments. And he gave us a Barcelona moment, which you know, aside from aside from Reece Nelson, is still the the best Emirates ever, moment ever. So, yeah, I'd say between those, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna list them in order. Those are uh, those, I think because you forget someone. <laughs> Yeah, I think those are fairly that's fairly rounded off. Thank you very much for that, Josh. Okay, let's move on now. Um, small little matter of Liverpool this weekend. Ooh. Not 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 too big a game or anything, is it? Oh God, help How us! How you feeling all. about it? I um, did you watch Liverpool Chelsea? No, They're I watched so the highlights. Good. I watched the highlights, and I know. I mean, Chelsea were diabolical. But this Liverpool team is special. It's really, really going to be a tough task. And I know that if I was picking a group of players to to quell the threat, I would have Gabriel, uh, Saliba, and Declan Rice. But even so, like you, you just there's something about this team this year that I think might just be a little bit better, not just than than Arsenal, but even than City as well. Really, I'm, I'm scared. It's weird though, because I mean, Arsenal played them twice in the last month, basically got a really good draw at Anfield and played them off the park for 60 minutes in the in the FA Cup game, and absolutely should have won that match. Um, so yeah, I, I know they're playing well. I do feel like they've they've found a bit of a groove in the last sort of month or mm. so. Liverpool, because the first half of the season, you took you know talk to their fans and stuff. They weren't they were they were scraping wins. They weren't playing brilliantly. No one really believed they were this title winning team. But I think that has changed certainly in the last six weeks. They signed of clicked a little bit haven't they i mean adam's got in ever touch since they got rid of salah yeah basically uh, that was supposed to be the moment it all came crashing down it's not quite panned out like that um adam here says hi charles charles and james having watched Connor bradley in midweek and haven't been impressed by him since he came into liverpool side how do you think Arteta will try and negate combat his contributions down the right uh, yes i'm sorry this is a none too well disguised question about playing zinchenko at left back i have my concerns given each player's strength do we actually have another um option strategy um, could we go three at the back and play Zinni in midfield? I'm not trying to beat up on Zinni, but Bradley has been exceptional for Liverpool. His first appearance for them this season, of course. Now I've raised the issue. Trent will probably get the nod on Thunder. Yeah, it's mad that we're talking about Conor Bradley potentially playing instead of uh, Trent on the right hand side. I'm sure they'd both probably play, but um, I mean, when you sort of look at the team that Arsenal could play, I mean, look, I, I think Zinchenko plays. I, I can't yeah. imagine he doesn't play. I think he's definitely going to come in for that. He's going to definitely keep his place in that one. Did you see the Forest game? Did you watch it? Well, you were you were somewhere else, weren't you? I was at Villa, but I've I have I watched all of the first half and I've watched back the second half as well. Didn't I've yeah. kind of watched it after? So it's weird when you know what's coming, but yeah, yeah. Um, it was, what did you what did you make of it? The the, the game. Uh, I mean, I thought the first half of the first half was actually dreadful, and I'm not getting particularly carried away by the rest. It's it's really hard. Because I know playing against low blocks is hard. And when you that start was, That badly... was the lowest of low oh, blocks. Yeah. I mean, I've seen a lot of low <laughs> blocks this season. That was pretty remarkable watching that. Even the Forest fans were getting really annoyed by it. They were, you know, when you get that classic thing of the fans like standing up and telling everyone, get out, get out, you know, <laughs> move forward. They were doing that after like 10, 15 minutes. It was, it was like... A, you know you're protecting a lead with with two minutes to go and everyone's dropped back it was it was it was so low it's so strange because they, they they gave they gave for as good as they got against united and i mean i suppose it's just a reminder that Arsenal are much better than united in newcastle um it's hard and wait when you, you know one thing that say city are just a level above arsenal at is when they're against those low blocks they make sure in those first 10 15 minutes that they are on it Mm. And that's when they get their goal, and everything is easy street when that happens. And you know, obviously, this isn't relevant for Sunday, but by God, if Arsenal could come up with a way of just putting more pressure on the opposition early on, it would 
change their season. Mm-hmm. I'm not worried about Zinch. Well, no, I'm. I mean, I accept the inevitability of Zinchenko starting because I thought it was a little bit clumsy, wasn't it, for the Forest goal? I mean, it's it not was, alone in that but regard. I do think. I said this. These yesterday, I do feel happen. like he's the whipping boy a little bit at the moment. Yeah. There was a lot wrong. There was lots of things wrong with that goal, and you know the, the the guy who played the pass was given far too much time to pick his pass and play it over. Yes, Sinchenko was a yard further back and didn't hold the line, but then Saliba should have done better. Was you know there was lots of. I just feel mm. everyone at the moment is very very keen to pick a hole in everything Sinchenko does and. You know, you. I watched that game, and Zinchenko was good, and was very, very important to Arsenal winning that game. And yet, again, just all the talk afterwards seems to have been about the goal Arsenal conceded, rather than the two goals they scored and the fact they won the game. You know, every every goal comes from a mistake, pretty much. You can always yeah. find a mistake in a goal that every team can, scores. And I find that now, I don't know if it's just me, but every. There seems to be so much focus on every goal the team can seize. I don't know if this was heightened by the fact that there was the row at full row at full time between him and White. Maybe that's sort of shone a brighter light on it and it's become more of a talking point. But yeah, it's just surprised me a little bit. I think the the reaction to you know Arsenal win that game, and yet so much of the talk afterwards has been about the goal they conceded. And um, yeah, I don't know. It just surprised me a bit. It's yeah. I, I... I think some, like you say, I think Zin, like I mean Zinchenko. Anytime anything goes wrong, people sort of immediately look to Zinchenko and go, "Well, how how is this his fault?" And like, yeah, he didn't cover himself in glory, but and he doesn't defensively. But the trade off to that is, I get someone that can go and play a hundred passes at ninety six percent accuracy and dictate the tempo, and I think that would be incredibly valuable because if Arsenal are going to you know, assert themselves on Liverpool, it's going to be by making sure that game is played in their final third. I mean, going back to the question as well about Connor Bradley, I'm actually not that worried because one thing I will say about Gabriel Martinelli that we never celebrate as much as we should is that guy puts in so much work off the ball. And it's Mm. the thing Arteta will, you know, if you ever talk about Martinelli with Arteta, the thing he says makes up when Arteta's having his great games it's when he's doing that tracking back and whether it's Bradley, I mean, especially if it's Bradley, because he's a bit more up and down the right flank. And I feel like that's easier for a player like Martinelli to deal with than Alexander Arnold sort of drifting wherever he wants to go. <laughs> I mean, Zinchenko against Jota, considering how well Jota moves and, and where he can pick up positions, you'd be mad not to be worried about that, but mm. you've just got to trust your your defenders there's there's no option i'd rather have and i'm absolutely not in the business of like changing everything that's good about arsenal to cover for zinchenko maybe having one tough moment against jota or bradley or whoever yeah. might i think happen. we have to remember as well that he's pro- i said this again yesterday he's probably arsenal's third choice left back i think if everyone's fit mm. he wouldn't be starting this weekend would he if everyone was fit he wouldn't be starting. And there's a reason for that. He is clearly, there are issues there defensively with Zinchenko. And so you are going to get mistakes from time to time because it's not, you know, that is just what you get from him. He's a very good player. He's very important to Arsenal play. When he plays, he's always involved. But, you know, I I don't think, it's not, it's not um, a mystery or anything like that. You know, Arteta knows it. it, Tommy Asu would be playing if Tommy Asu was here. On Sunday, I'm absolutely sure of it. From what we saw in the summer, Timber would be playing if he was here and available. So, you know, if you're playing your third choice left back, you you're probably going to get a few issues. Yeah. But if, if Zinchenko is your third choice left back, that's saying a lot about the quality that you have in your squad as well. To be fair, because he's still a very very good player. I mean, what do you think in terms of the midfield? Because I mean, it was it was great that Smith Rowe started against Forest. I was absolutely delighted when I got there and word started to drift through that. It looked like he was starting. I thought he did well. You know, it's nothing spectacular, but you know, he he played well. He was bright. I think in the first half, in that against that ultra low block, I thought he would as looked as likely as anyone to to be the spark that that opened Forest up at times. Um, but having said that, yeah, and I don't think he's done anything to lose his place. And I think if Arsenal were playing Bournemouth at home on Sunday, I think Smith Rowe starts and keeps his place, but. Mm-hmm. I don't think he will start on Sunday. I'd be. I, I think Jorginho 
will probably come in for this game with Declan Rice. I think if Thomas Partey was fit, he would definitely start. But it doesn't look like Thomas Partey is going to be fit. We might find out a little bit more from Arteta today at the Shoba Training Centre. Um, <laughs> what do you reckon? Shoba. How would you how do you envisage the midfield shaping up at the weekend? Yeah, spot on. I mean, Jorginho had a brilliant game last time out against uh, in the FA Cup, didn't he? And uh, I was really sceptical a year ago when he arrived because um, when you looked at him at Chelsea, it was i mean, it was like he'd sort of taken root on the Stamford Bridge pitch and he couldn't move. But I think in a team like, for a team like Arsenal, it's just not as much of a problem because Arsenal are so well protected against the counter. And when he's pa- paired with Rice, I think Rice does understand that He's got to be a bit more live to transition moments, and he's he's able to to drop back and and make his interceptions that he always does. So I can then cope because congratulations, Liverpool, you've got past Jorginho. Here's Rice, Saliba, uh, Gabriel. Try and get past them. Um, I think Jorginho for games like this is excellent as well. He just he has that big game mentality, and I know that's a sort of vague, abs- abstract concept that might mean nothing, but I've seen Jorginho play some some really, really good games. I didn't necessarily know that that would carry over to Arsenal, but like it, it is, he's a great footballer. And, you know, talk about Zinchenko as third choice left back. Jorginho um, as your third choice DM is the best, some of the best depth I can ever remember Arsenal having at any position up there with the sort of strike force of the Invincibles. Yeah, it's really, really solid. I mean, when we're looking at it, what, Raya, White, Saliba, Gabriel, Zinchenko, Jorginho, Rice, Odegaard, Saka, Jesus, Martinelli. Can't see it being, can't see it being yeah. anything else than that. Can you? I mean, yeah. is there a, is there a, a strong shout for Smith Rowe keeping his place? Not really. I, I mean, I know we've, we, as much as anyone, will sort of hammer home the point that it's not about one game for Smith Rowe; it's about a run of games. But even that has to be has to be sensible. And mm. you know, I don't think Smith Rowe would uh, go into the dressing room on Saturday when Arteta tells him the team and go, "Boss, why are you picking Jorginho over me?" If that's what happens, yeah, for this game, you know, it's it's shrewd, it's sensible. And then, by the way, off the bench, if he's fit, you can bring in Thomas Partey. You can bring in uh, Trossard, Kai Havertz. Like, I think for a game like this as well, you do need to think about what am I going to do? If it's one all in the 70th minute, what am I, Mikel Arteta, going to do to to tweak the plans, give Liverpool something they can't quite cope with and, and, and get the winner? Um, yeah. And I think, I mean, that maybe is the argument for keeping someone like Martinelli in reserve. Um, Like... If he does that, I would say it's not mad, but I don't. I don't think he will, and I don't think he should. No, you kind of look at this game. It's going to be a rare, a rare match for Arsenal, and not coming up against a low block. And there's going to be, you would imagine, <laughs> yeah. there is going to be space to run into for for the likes of Martinelli and Saka. Um, so I think you'd, but you'd be starting both of those. I thought the subs were, were good against Nottingham Forest. I thought Trossard came on and was really, really good. It was a really bright cameo. I thought Havertz came on and did well as well. Um, and there is definitely options there to change things if needed but yeah that, I think that's starting 11 I listed I'd be very very surprised if we um if we see any more I mean how do you view it is this a is this a must win game for Arsenal or are we is it still a bit too early to be saying that it's definitely a must not lose game there's no doubt about that but you know if it's a draw are you walking away from the Emirates at the weekend thinking that's title chances gone or do you think they just they simply have to win no I, I mean I don't, I don't think the title chances will be gone I don't, I'm not even like, you know, if they, if they lose, I'll be like, ah, but I wouldn't be like, oh, they can't win the title now. Um, I, yeah, I think a draw would be okay. You know, there's a lot of games here, and as much as I just said, like Liverpool look irresistible. It's, it's a long way to go in this season. Um, I, I think more the way you guys to think about it is. If, if Arsenal win and if they win in a sort of authoritative way, that could be the sort of game. I mean, I'm sort of imagining a bit here, but I'm like, that could be a game that makes me just reassess where I had this Arsenal team in my head. Because at the moment I look at them as 
a slight step behind City and Liverpool. But also, like, I can't get out of my head, you know, all the XG numbers, all of that just tell you that Arsenal's defence is the best in the league by a country mile, like about 15% less XG given up than City and way less than Liverpool, like 17 XG to 24. So, like, if this defence holds firm, in general, you know, you, you and I know defence doesn't win Premier League titles, but maybe it could if it's as good as, as Arsenal's. Well, a better defence last season would have won the Premier League title, no doubt exactly. about it, because that, that was a title winning attack Arsenal had in terms of the numbers of goals they scored. Um, sort of keeping in theme with Liverpool, um, Ben here has got in touch and said, every morning at work is better with the daily updates. Thanks for the great content. With Sunday's game in mind, what are your favourite home wins against Liverpool? The 4-1 of Ozil's free kick was brilliant. I loved the 2013-14 win with Ramsey's screamer. Oh, what a goal that was. Uh, one to forget was a ridiculous 1-1 game in 2010-2011. Oh, God. I, my hand almost still hurts from hitting the chair as hard as I hit it in the stadium that day when uh, Abue oh. gave away that penalty. Um, although it was never a penalty, by the way. He absolutely bought that, whoever it was. It was Lucas, wasn't it, I, I think, who, uh, who went down? Or was It It was Kout scored it, wasn't it? Kout scored it, yeah. But I think it was Lucas who sort of... But, a Bue Probably rubbish Liverpool that. team that as well, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, and I guess the four-two invincible season beats them all. Cheers, Ben. So, what um, what are you thinking for that? What what games sort of spring to mind in terms of Arsenal versus Liverpool? I mean, objectively, like the four-two beats them all. The four-two is the invincibles result, isn't it? It's um, one of the greatest, one of the greatest moments in in Arsenal history. The way that having been knocked out of the Champions League in ludicrous fashion, having been knocked out of the FA Cup. It's slightly self-inflicted fashion. And then like the invincible record looks like it's going and Thierry just changes everything. That's it. That's the the gold standard. And I can't better that. I can tell you some games I really enjoyed. I know it's not a win, but you remember that 3-3 just before, I mean, just before Christmas. Was it sort of 23rd of December a few years back? Late in Wenger's reign, yeah. Or was it even Emery's? I'm looking at that kit. Maybe it's Emery. It was Wenger. It was Wenger. Wenger, final year. Where Arsenal kind of come from 2-0 down to win 3-2. I mean, it's not... They didn't win 3-2. It's 3 all. To, 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 to draw 3 all. yeah. Go 3-2 up and uh, and then blow it. It was it's like three goals in six minutes, wasn't it? Ozil was sensational for those six minutes on play. Yeah, it, it was I, a chop. Quite... It was his, his chop goal, wasn't it? So it chop bounced goal. into the ground and over the keeper. There was a, Honestly, when that goal went in, the noise in the stadium yeah. that day. I was sitting next to Chris Wheatley in the press box that day and I just remember punching him on the arm <laughs> and he scored. <laughs> I was so excited I just punched him on the arm just like it was just it was mad because Liverpool been brilliant for like 60 minutes absolutely yeah. battered Arsenal and then suddenly just like that the game the game changed it Sanchez scored a header then Xhaka thundered one in that um whoever was in goal as Mignolet wasn't it um should have done better with and then Ozil scored yeah and then typically Firmino I think <laughs> typical scored Arsenal once again typical right, Firmino against Arsenal um, oh, yeah, yeah that, was a, that was a special one I've still got uh I'm still going to be sort of nervously checking the Liverpool team sheet on this in the 70th well, minute going Jot, Jot has just basically replaced Firmino in there yeah, in the amazing. just score against score against Arsenal every time he plays against them anyway so it's like one, one goes guy. but they've got another one that guy is so good he is so um, good. he's brilliant by the way, uh, cbssports.com, by the time this is out, you can read my piece on why Darwin Nunez is the second best striker in the Premier League. I, 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 think, he's great. <laughs> I, I think he's great, Darwin Nunez. I really do. I think he's Phenomenal. just absolutely chaos at his, at his best. And then, um, yeah, I think he's. I think and I, he's a and I think the, the, like, that game last season was a perfect game for Darwin Nunez, the 3 2, um, which I'm throwing in late because it didn't get a mention there. But um, it I like, should get a mention. Absolutely. I might leave that one to you, but that what it I mean that's the game that sort of typifies the best moments of Arsenal's season last season, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, no, that's definitely up there. It was it was brilliant. The noise at levels that uh, my my niece went to that game with my dad. Um because I was in the press box, obviously. So my niece was sitting in my seat and um she she'd she'd been a lot of times, but she hadn't been for about she hadn't been that season. And she was genuinely scared <laughs> by the atmosphere of it. She, you know, it was so different, man. She went, she, she'd been used to the Emirates atmosphere, but she hadn't been that season. And obviously last season was completely different in terms of the atmosphere. We all talked about it. And um, 
yeah, it, like it properly, she. I mean, my dad was saying it like she was a bit sort of freaked out by it. She just had it was so loud, it was so passionate and intense, and um, yeah, just caught her off guard slightly because she's so used to the usual Emirates atmosphere. <laughs> and um, last seasons was just so great. So that that was up there. I tell you what, my this game nineteen ninety at Highbury. This is my first ever Arsenal versus Liverpool game, and it was the season we won the title. The second second season under Graham, we won the title, and it was early on in the season. In, so it was still in nineteen ninety rather than in the second half in nineteen ninety one. And we battered them three 0 at Highbury. I was in the junior gunners section, um, and we beat. Yeah, Merce scored sort of forced one over the line at the back post with his header. I think Dick, Dixon scored a penalty and then Smudger at the end scored this brilliant goal in front of North Bank when Merce did a lovely back heel into the path and Smudger drove it drove it across into the far corner and it was it was such a battering and it was like it was yeah I'd grown up you know watching yeah. Liverpool win everything and obviously we just sort of got ahead of them in the in the 89 season and then Liverpool won it back the following season and this was my first game actually seeing that famous kind of Liverpool team in the flesh and just seeing Arsenal destroy him and Smudger was my favourite player and he scored that goal right at the end. And um, it's just always a game that absolutely is just right up here. Whenever I think of Arsenal-Liverpool, I think of this game. So I it, I know that's throwing it back a long, long way, but that's oh, absolutely yeah. probably, I would still say, my favourite ever win against Liverpool was that because it just means it just, yeah, it has a very special place in my heart on that one. So, yeah. Mere months um, old I was. Yeah, mm. I, I mean, the Thierry Henry one, obviously, I missed that game. Oh no! I missed it. It was my own fault. I went clubbing and been out all night. Got home about <laughs> seven in the morning, um, and I was with my girlfriend at the time. And uh, I think I woke up at about <laughs> we'd fallen asleep, and I woke up about one in the afternoon. And I, and I just totally missed the game with loads of missed calls from my dad, like "Where the hell are you? What's going on?" And uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I missed it. What a nightmare! What a nightmare! I know. One of the right, I think we're, we're getting to the end of this. There's just one here um, from Janos, which I thought was an interesting one to end on. It looks more like it's Ooh. looking more likely that United are going to get rid of Sancho and Rashford in the summer. Wait, I don't, I'm not sure they'll get rid of Rashford in the summer. I think, <laughs> Good luck. I, I think Ten Hag goes before Rashford goes. Um, yeah. uh, uh, assuming they cost around the same amount, which player would you want Arsenal to go for out of these two? And this is purely, obviously, completely hypothetical because it's not going to happen. But what, what would you get? What would you say to that? Oh, it's a really good question. Um, I'm going to say Jaden Sancho. I think he's slightly, I mean, I'm going to sort of like imagine and from the looks of what he's doing at Dortmund might not take too much imagining. Imagine he can get back to the, that player. And I think someone that's a bit more of a, um, what's the right way of putting this? A creative w winger rather than a, you know, shooting wide forward. I think that would add a bit more to Arsenal. He's and he's also much more adept at just playing both flanks. I mean, like like you say. I mean, I'm not I'm not taking either because United are going to want a decent wedge of money. I mean, I rem I know what they were asking for for was about sixty million last summer for Sancho, um, and the wages are just daft. And I'm not in the business of trying to fix anyone's footballers. Um, yeah, but Sancho, where are you? Yeah, neither. Um, probably same as you. But I, if you had to, if I had to pick one, I think I'd probably pick Rashford rather than Sancho, just because I'm not, I'm not. I, I wonder how much damage the last couple of years has done to mm. Sancho in terms of whether he will ever get back to the sort of form that we we sort of saw him um, showing in Germany. Um, I'd be more confident that Rashford would be a lot easier to get back to, you know, becoming a twenty goal a season player than yeah. than, than Sancho. But I. I Probably, I wouldn't take it either of them. I mean, talking about United, did you see that game last night? Absolutely <laughs> crazy, crazy ending. Lovely goal by Pedro Neto, by the way. Who, uh, if, you put, if you put Pedro Neto in that list with Sancho and Rashford and Neto, I know which player I'd be choosing out of the three of them. Um, but yeah, Mino, what a goal. I suppose there's another example, sort of taking it back to how we started the show, of a youngster getting an opportunity. Um, again, because because Man United injury. are rubbish. Probably, yeah, and uh, and season's opportunity, and um, what a goal that was by him! But crazy, crazy. Pe Pete Barclays, as the kids say on uh, on social, absolutely sensational bit of football. I remember when those games used to involve Arsenal. I know, as opposed to grinding their way to a two 0 win, well, briefly looking like they might throw it away. Let's see how this weekend pans out because I've got a feeling it's going to be an absolute belter on Sunday, and I think it's going to be very, very. Are you there? Are you going? 
yeah i just feel like at least if i'm there i might have some ability to influence it in some way Hi yeah. otherwise it would just be hiding behind the sofa i'm in the stands so i'm not i'm not in the press box so i won't be with you but uh, i'll be in the uh, i'll be opposite you um in the in the stands with my dad for that one so yeah, very much kind of looking forward to it and dreading it at the same time it is mm -hmm. one of, it is a proper proper big game feel i can it's going to be one of those matches walking up to the stadium when the uh, the nerves are certainly jangling when you get to when you're sort of looking at the stadium and trying to expect what to come all right that's it look 55 minutes good timing for this one i'm gonna get this out because i've got to head off to uh london colney or whatever it's called now i've forgotten already show bar Shut up. show yeah exactly that um so yeah cheers for joining me mate thank you everyone as usual for watching or listening appreciate it as always like i said i'm heading to the training ground for Mikel Arteta's press conference to so keep your eyes peeled on all the usual stuff from me on my socials in terms of what he's had to say i'll try if i can to do a quick video afterwards as well just summing up all the big talking points uh so keep your eyes peeled for that as well and then i'll be back tomorrow to really start to look ahead to that game against liverpool until then thank you for watching cheers james catch up with you soon mate cheers see you soon